quick. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started with introductions. So first off speaking, we have Mr. John Griggs. John Griggs is, um, let's see, I'm going to read this, so I'm sorry that you guys are going to tell that I'm reading from a piece of paper, but that's what I'm doing. Um, Maggie Creek Ranch is a beef, cow, calf, and stalker operation in the high desert of Elko County, Nevada. John Griggs is the ranch manager of this Maggie Creek Ranch with responsibility for all aspects of the ranch. He also serves as president-elect of the Nevada Cattlemen's Association, who functions to promote a dynamic and profitable Nevada beef industry. He was named Cattleman of the Year for the association in 2015 and in 2016. Maggie Creek was awarded the National Environmental Stewardship Award, and John has since been invited all over the country to speak of Maggie Creek's conservation efforts. Griggs worked at various ranches in Nevada before joining Maggie Creek in 1991. He started there as a cowboy and was promoted to cow boss, then manager in 1998. He has been active in the community, serving as an EMTI with Elko County Ambulance Service, serving on various resource or agricultural related advisory boards and serving youth sports 4-H activities. Griggs lives at Maggie Creek Ranch headquarters west of Elko with his wife, Shelly, and, and their two children, Wyatt and Mackie. Thank you for being here, John. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Tracy K. Shore. Tracy Shore grazes cattle on public and private lands along with Ryan M. Bach. She is a sixth generation livestock producer and is a partner in her family's multi-generational <coughs> farm that produces rice and walnuts. For a decade, Ryan and Tracy have worked with nonprofits and agencies to use grazing as an as an, an integral part of land stewardship in Northern California. They graze cattle in conjunction with promoting oaks, vernal pools, burrowing owls, and on sites with purple needle grass restoration and wetland enhancement with beavers. Tracy has a master's degree in horticulture and agro agronomy, agronomy, sorry, <laughs> from University of California Davis, and has a bachelor's of science degree from California State University Chico. Since 2017, she has served the University of California Livestock and Natural Resource Advisor for Butte, Plumas, and Sierra County. Shore is also a graduate of Class 39 of the California Agricultural Leadership Program. Thanks so much for making it, Tracy, and nice to meet you. Um, and then last on our panel, we will be hearing from Ms. Betsy Stapleton. Um, originally in the agenda, I did note that Betsy was the chair of the Scott River Watershed Council. However, she recently stepped down and she's representing herself today as an individual and a rancher. Betsy is a retired nurse practitioner and her husband, Michael, own, a, own and operate a small cow-calf ranch in Siskiyou County. Their property lies on French Creek, one of California's most productive spawning and rearing streams for coho salmon, a listed species. French Creek surface water along with groundwater supplies irrigation to the ranch. French Creek also supports a population of beavers who actively dam the creek and irrigation ditches chew down trees and increase ground and surface water. Betsy and her husband have implemented many restoration projects for the benefit of coho, including beaver dam analogs. These, these diverse factors place Betsy in a position to understand many of the complex issues around beavers, water, fish, and the regulatory environment. And thanks so much for making it, Betsy. I know you're also busy as the other panelists are, and it's nice to see you again, even if it's on the screen at this time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it off without any further ado to John Briggs. And the last time I tried to allow you to share your screen, I didn't see the option pop up. So Nancy, if you're um, still the main host, you might have that ability. I was hoping as co-host I could <clears throat> do that. Unless John, do you see at the bottom, do you have the option to go ahead and share screen? Maybe everybody's allowed to share screen and that's why it's not giving me the permission to permit you. Good morning. So I think Nancy just enabled it. I think we're, I think we're ready to go here. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. How's that? Wonderful. <clears throat> great, great to be with you all this morning. Thanks for having me. So if you were to jump on Interstate 80 and head 10 hours east, you'd probably make it to Sacramento and then Another seven or so, another seven or so hours, you'd be in this part of the world. Uh, Maggie Creek Ranch is in the northeast corner of, El of Nevada and Elko County, and it's high desert operation, something like uh, 5,000 to 8,000 feet in elevation and um, eight to 10 inches of precipitation in a year, most of that coming in snow. We are a beef cattle operation 
uh, Angus based uh, moderate framed 11 to 1200 pound cow in her working clothes brings home a 500 pound calf in the fall. <clears throat> Lint water is our limiting factor, not only to grow forage, but also for stock water. Um, it takes about 100 acres to run a cow in this part of the world. When I, when I hired on to Maggie Creek Ranch as a cowboy, early 90s, this is what Susie Creek looked like. Susie Creek runs down through the heart of the ranch. And what's remarkable to me about this picture is that it, uh, it has water. What I remembered of Susie Creek was being dry for most of the year. Um, this must have been early spring or late fall when, when this picture was taken. But when you look at that picture, you think, what, what is the value there for anybody? And unless you're a, maybe a gravel pit operator, there's not much value there for anybody, especially if that water is not there. So, so we decided to make some changes. We changed our grazing regime and, and sort of eliminated hot season grazing. And, and when we did that, changes happened pretty fast. And, and this is what it looked like two or three years into it, uh, the, the, the creek itself narrowed and cooled and we started growing riparian vegetation. And, and we started replacing this upland vegetation sagebrush with, with willows and, and um, riparian grasses. And then the star of our show showed up, beaver. Be when we created the habitat, beaver came along and I, I, I didn't have much experience with beaver other than the traditional experience in that, you know, we don't want them in our irrigation systems. We don't want them damming a culvert in a road, those kind of things. So when they showed up, I, I didn't know what to think. I thought, well, they're going to undo all the work we've done. They're going to, they're going to consume all the willows that we grew there. It's, it's not going to be a good thing, but <clears throat> I couldn't have been wronger. They, they made places like this. And, and when you think about the earlier picture where this was pretty much nothing but gravel, what's the value there now? So, so not only that water that's available for our livestock to drink, but, but also that green riparian vegetation, which is huge value to us. And then, you know, obviously other values too for fish and wildlife. And, and aesthetic values as well, which, which is also important, at least to me. And places like this, you know, same, same thing, where, where a lot of great green uh, riparian vegetation at a time of year when we don't have it, um, water available for stock water. And this, and this place here, this picture was taken a few years ago when we were in a pretty severe drought, not, not quite as bad as we are now, but, but still pretty severe when, uh, when um, a, lot of, a lot of ranchers, a lot of ranchers in this area are hauling water to the cattle, which is, which is a miserable proposition. We, we had places like this where our cattle were able to access water where we might've had to haul it to them in the past to be able to use adjacent pastures. And so you might be thinking, if you're not hot season grazing, how do you access that water? And, and this is the answer. So we, we built uh, lanes, water gaps to the creek where cattle can come down this lane here and, and get a drink, but not, but not hang out in the riparian area and access that forage when we don't want them to. And, and, Obviously, that, that lane will get pretty beat out when cattle are using it, but it's my show, my slide. I get to show it when it looks pretty good. <laughs> and a few years ago, we had a 100-year flood event. And when I went to look at it, I thought, oh, man, all, all that good hard work has, has been washed down the creek. And, and Kate, my dog, was so beside herself, she couldn't even look at it. But <laughs> really what happened was, that all that riparian vegetation did its job and trapped sediment and raised that floodplain and started the process all over again. So now that area looks 
an awful lot like it did in previous slides, but a foot or two higher. And so eventually we will we will fill in this this cut bank that that happened over time and and then we can then we can sort of work on flooding that whole valley, which is pretty exciting to me and I hope it happens. Um, probably not in my lifetime, but maybe in my children's lifetime. And, and so you think about what, what, how this happened, you know, beaver, beaver slowed down the water. They, they spread it out. They sort of hydrated that, that, uh, that channel to, they hydrated that sponge that is there so that water doesn't disappear. So, you know, there's, there's the thought that, well, if you have beaver, they're impounding water and they're reducing flow, which, you know, can, can really be a tough thing. And in a, in a, in especially in a state like Nevada, where whiskey is for drinking and water's for fighting over. Uh, we can't impound water without, without a right to do it. But really what happens with beaver is that they, they hydrate the floodplain, they hydrate that sponge so that water will flow over it and not, and not sink into it. So, so what what we've what we've learned is that is that we have we we have more water flowing down this system than less with beaver in it. And, and another interesting thing about this is is that uh, beavers will sort of eat themselves out of house and home, like like you may have noticed in in previous slides. They'll consume all the all the woody vegetation available, and then they'll move on and, and the cycle kind of starts over again. And it's, it's really made me a beaver believer and, and, it's, and it's kind of a, might be kind of an odd thing in that, you know, I, I come to you today wearing a, a beaver hat and I hope that, I hope that doesn't make anybody hyperventilate, but, but I, Beaver, Beaver, I've done a wonderful thing for this ranch, and and um, I hope I hope they can work for you as well. I think uh, the more we have, the more we're able to deal with our water problems in the West. Eight minutes, thirteen seconds. I'm under time. Oh my gosh. It's so wonderful. I know I can tell you're wrapping up once you hit the eight minute mark. I'm like, I don't need to say anything. Um, <laughs> Thank you so very much, John. It was wonderful hearing from you and your perspective and your experience out there at Maggie Creek Ranch. I loved the giggle about the, your dog not even able to witness what was going on. <laughs> Thank you again and again. And again, just for folks that showed up um, during that presentation, we are going to be holding um, and waiting until we hear from all three of our wonderful panelists before we open up to Q&A and comments. So with that and without further ado, um, I would like to pass it off to Tracy. Okay, can you hear me okay, Sarah? Yes, thank you for checking. Okay, okay. let's see if we can get. Um, is that looking okay for you guys? Yep, just want to go right. into um, slideshow and hit play. So it should, does it switch in for you guys? Well, right now I can see your thumbnails on the on the left margin, although I can't like really, really see them. I just see them. So literally. I put it into preview mode, but now it's not doing anything. Oh, great. Well, this is okay too, Tracy. Don't worry, because it's not like, okay. it's not like when you can see Because <laughs> I can't screen. see you or anything. It just went full screen to, huh, that's weird. I wonder why. Can you still see it? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. All right. So everyone, my name is Tracy Shore. Um, Sarah introduced me earlier. Uh, just to give you, uh, I'm here representing our family operation as a ranch. Like she mentioned, I do have a full-time position with Cooperative Extension, um, working as a livestock and natural resources advisor, but do spend weekends, holidays, vacation days, um, uh, participating in our family's farming operation and along with my other half, Ryan, um, in this picture in Colton. So Ryan did help me create this picture or presentation today. And we went through it last night a few times just to make sure that we had all of the perspectives of how beavers have been a part of our grazing operation um, at one of the places that we lease 
in Placer County. And so um, as we recall, this is like the first picture that I can find of beavers when they first showed up in about April of 2016. And like John was talking about, it was like, we called the, the land manager and we're like, hey, you know, for the land trust and was like, do you want beavers there? Like, are we concerned? Because they had warned me about not running over the new trees that they had planted in the floodplain with the four wheeler when we're moving cows and we had some restoration sites and we didn't want them. And I'm like, so I think it was, you know, that balancing act of where do beavers fit in? And so this is a picture of one of the feet first on its own um, beaver dams at the parcel. And uh, it was kind of the impetus of starting a bigger partnership with the partners program for US Fish and Wildlife Service. And I think Damien, who is now the partners biologist in your area had actually recommended I share um, our perspectives as ranchers um, to the group. And so here is a picture from Damien of the pre-project site. And as you can see, um, the beaver dam that I showed you is actually towards the bottom of the screen. It's not on the screen. In 2016, that later on that same year, they put in a beaver dam that you see marked there in the middle of the screen. Um, and the yellow is what is the quote original floodplain of that area. And you can see that black dotted line where there was a hundred year plus levy that was put in. And so as part of this multi-phase project, the, there was two sections of levy that were removed that opened up that entire floodplain between the yellow dotted areas. And so as you, the vegetation there you can see is dry. Um, there is a lot of blackberries. So it was pretty useless grazing lands. Um, you know, we could go down in there, you know, in the springtime, the cattle kind of had, they were split into the uplands on the right side of this picture and the left side. Um, so we had essentially two parcels of grazing on this um, place. And this floodplain was dry annual vegetation, not um, a wetland. And so uh, the original, it was called um, the old riparian fencing is there in the red dots um, that was attempting to keep the cattle out of the floodplain or out of the creek area, which is limited access. And as part of this project, that area was redesigned to create more of a riparian pasture. And so the fencing was then moved as part of this partners project up into the uplands. And there's a, you can see right there, the old fencing up on the levee and the new fencing that is in there. And then just from a different angle, we do graze this as part of our grazing regime. And I'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Um, but this is what we look like now. And it's a significant difference in terms of a single channel that was flowing through the property to multiple meandering courses um, and a significant change in the vegetation. And so just to take you back to what it did look like um, as a pretty dry area that was flood controlled with the levees to uh, what we have today um, as part of our grazing operation. And so, uh, some of the wins that we see for ranching is that we got sub irrigated pasture as part of this. And um, one of the neat things about that is, is on this annual grazing lands, our grazing season is typically somewhere November-ish, depending on when we first get our rainfall um, in Placer County to, and it's right on the valley floor. So the elevation there is just rolling foothills. Um, it's not, it's pretty much flat land is what I would consider it. Um, and some high quality forage at the end of our season. So we are fall calvers. So we calve October or August, September-ish. Um, and then we wean those calves off in April, May. And so one of the unique things about this is we're actually able to graze that site. And it's one of, um, as part of our grazing program in usually about mid to late May, we will put the calves in there for you know 10 to 14 days and then we will wean them off and sell them. And so they really come off very flush. Um, they have a great coat of hair, they're fat, they're happy. Um, and so it's working as part of our livestock production system. And also we're able to have a longer grazing season. So then we'll pull the cows back out of there, rest it a little bit. And before we ship our cows north um, that are on this parcel, go back up to Klamath in Modoc County. 
um, we will put them back in there for another 10 to 14 days, depending on vegetation. And so we will flash graze it again um, with the cattle back in there. And so I talked about how we change those fences. And so one of the other parts of this is we feel we have better livestock distribution. And so there was not great fencing that was keeping the cattle out of the riparian area. But as part of this project, um, working with the partners program, was able to put in um, some more reliable fencing um, that help can help push the cattle into the uplands more. And so um, controlling their access into that riparian pasture, but also creating better distribution across the landscape. Uh, and another thing to think about, this is a conservation piece of property. And so there's no hunting allowed on it. But uh, here you can see some pairs of ducks that were jumping up yesterday morning when I was there. And so a potential option for doing projects like these for ranchers could be an alternative income with hunting or for you know, self and family use, if that's something that you like to do as hunting, um, could be part of the outcomes of a project like this. Some of the challenges that we have is that we have annual grasslands on both sides of this creek. Which is great when you're working, you know, when you're working on restoring that floodplain of having that land acts, you know, land management, but it comes as a challenge when there's high water flows. And so here's what the creek used to look like throughout most of it. It was very channelized. If we did have a high flood event, um, it would prevent us one or two days, usually typically from moving the cattle, which let's be honest, I wasn't really a fan of moving them when during a rainstorm anyway. And so um, we would able to get across that creek at all times. And it wasn't really a huge concern, especially when I mentioned like, you know, we're coming on with calves that are a few months old. Um, sometimes we have a few late calvers or the spring calvers that are calving or the first calf heifers that calve a little bit later. So their calves are smaller. Um, that can present challenges um, when you change the, you know, floodplain and what it looks like there in the depths. Um, and so there's a picture of what, how we used to move that, or we still move them. Um, and there's a picture of them going through the flood lane coming from one side to the other. And now this is what that area looks like. It's very marshy. So it's a different dynamic um, in terms of our management. And so it really does capture a lot of those storm um, flows behind the dams and in the floodplain. Two minutes. Uh, okay. So just a few quick things is to think about is the challenges for ranching. And so I mentioned the high flows. Um, another one is using the low bid local contractor. And so as I'm a big fan of using local contractors, they can work great. But this picture right here, the contractor that they chose for the low bid that was local, decided to make the float for the water system out of a old plastic milk jug with spray foam. And it didn't last very long. And so I think that's just the tip of the iceberg that I share with you of when you're picking a contractor is to really think about, you know, the challenges that can present long term. And so another one is using, you know, it doesn't cost that much more to do four prong biofire that has a little bit more strength. We got concerns when cattle were in the riparian area when they didn't want them in there. And they actually weren't our cattle. But when you have two bulls and bulls fighting, um, Lower tensile strength barbed wire doesn't keep the cattle where they need to be. And then our electric fencing, um, there were some challenges initially with that where the insulators weren't large enough and so it was grounding out. And so I think just taking into consideration that when you're doing these projects with the infrastructure that comes along with them is making sure it all meets up. And so uh, this is the watering system that has not been in existence <laughs> uh, for a few years as part of the project, but it was. Um, and one other challenge is we did lose some forage. We talked about gaining forage, but it's just a matter of perspective of how you look at it. And so this is what the, that area looked like with some cottonwood trees down in there. And this is what it looked like yesterday. And so you can see that just a change in differences. And I have like three more quick pictures, Sarah, if that's okay. Um, and that, when I talk about how deep it is, that is a T-post that you can see there in the center. So this is what we're trying to cross cattle with. So it's, you know, we've, we figured out some options of where we can cross better below the beaver dam analogs. And so it's changed where those fences were, where our gates used um, and worked with it. And so just some broader thoughts. Um, John mentioned some of these about what are the water rights on the property? Um, is it considered irrigated pasture? Are you impeding flows? 
Um, and then also just is it a fit for the ranching operation? And so our operation, um, it, I think it's a good fit for. We talked about the challenges and options, but if you don't have enough uplands, you can see how an entire area can be inundated and then you've lost that grazing value for it. And so I think of making sure of when you're doing these projects are really supporting where you put the dams at or facilitating where the beaver dams um, go with the analogs um, is thinking of how it fits with that livestock operation as well. And uh, just what are the downstream threats? Um, so John mentioned how, you know, what would happen during the storm when they came through. And that's still a concern that we have is, you know, we have a lot of water backed up. You can see how deep it is. What happens if there is um, a break in this? How does that impact downstream users? And just, uh, just things to think about when you're working on these projects and having all the partners on board. And so there's a picture of our uplands there. So hopefully pretty close to your time. Yes, not too shabby. That was a lot, a lot jammed in there. So thank you so much for sharing all that. Is that Dodie Ravine? That is. Nice. Yeah, I got, I got a, a, the opportunity to hike around there a few years ago for a workshop and it's, yeah, it's monumental uh, how that landscape has changed and being able to like walk through there. Um, well, thank you so very much, Tracy. Super appreciate that. Um, again, we will have time for, for Q&A. We have one more speaker. And certainly last but not least, we have Betsy Stapleton and I will be sharing my screen for Betsy um, with her presentation. So you just let me know when you want me to advance. Let me pull this up. Let me get my timer going. All right. And let's see. My slideshow from the beginning. Is everybody able to see? Let's see the display. Sarah, yes, but again, it has the thumbnails on the side rather than being full screen. How about that? That's better. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right, take it away. Um, though we're only getting half the slide, maybe that's how I. Oh. Have. Shoot. In any case. <clears throat> All right, so um, there I am, I'm Betsy Stapleton, and um, I'm in Siskiyou County in Northern California. And on the left is a picture of our small cow-calf hay operation. And as Sarah mentioned in the introduction, we're dependent on water rights for irrigation. And that includes both surface water from Front Creek there that I'm showing you a beaver dam on. And in addition, we have groundwater rights. And as all of you are probably well aware, both of these issues are um, under a great deal of pressure at this time with the impending groundwater regulation and again, surface water uh, being in diminishing supply with the drought. Um, go ahead to that next slide. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> um, my husband and I are not economically dependent on our ranching operation, but we have enough um, exposure to all the issues um, involved in irrigated agriculture that um, I have an understanding of it, even though it's not our livelihood. I am also what I would call a passionate naturalist rather than um, an environmentalist. Um, the environmental world, the natural world is of tremendous interest to me. And there you can see me happily sampling coho salmon as part of the Watershed Council work. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Are you guys able to see everything now? Yeah. Okay, great. Just want to make sure I have, I also have techie issues with this stuff. Yeah, that's why I'm having you do it. It's <laughs> stressful for me. Thank you well, very much. What did you know? <laughs> um, as, as that last slide was titled, there's always a ba balance between um, natural use, uh, extraction, whatever you want to label it as, and natural use uh, protection and balancing those interests on the working landscape is pretty darn complex. When my husband and I bought this property, we had no idea what coho salmon were and really um, didn't know anything much about beavers. And we found that we were right um, in the center of both of those issues. And like many people who start living with beavers, we found them really to be problematic. And we instituted all kinds of, um, owner-driven mitigation me measures like trying to cage off trees that we like 
And frankly, um, we were under an obligation to protect under our TMDL obligations for the um, river here, which says that shade on streams is critical. So we have beavers out there chewing down trees and, and we have a regulatory obligations to actually plant and increase them. So we went out and put cages around them and, and found that when there were snowstorms and the beavers could climb on top and push the cages down, they could go ahead and chew those trees down. And on the right, you have a picture of a irrigation um, diversion infrastructure there. And the beavers would stuff that full every single day and we'd have to go out and yank the stuff out every day. And so then we tried this awkward putting a cage around it and then a high flow came and the cage collapsed and there was a bunch of debris in there and we had to yank it out. So all these things are really um, not insignificant going out every day and, and removing debris from an irrigation ditch increases a person's workload significantly. Um, Brock and Kate who are on the call have a great deal of expertise in terms of handling these kinds of issues. And I think offering landowners that um, are increasing their interest in supporting beaver on their landscape with tools and techniques to effectively manage these issues are not insignificant and is a really important consideration if the RCD wants to move forward with, with advocating for, for um, landowners supporting beavers on their property. Go ahead to the next page. So um, why would a landowner um, put up with this nonsense? And I think you've heard some things from, from the other speakers and they're not insignificant. On the left-hand side is that same beaver dam that um, was on the, on the front slide. And you can see that it, it's a pretty magnificent structure there over two feet. And those beavers uh, wanting to provide data as to their value um, built their dam right on top of a network of groundwater wells and a surface water um, measuring device that we had in stream. And on that graph there, you see the um, water surface elevation from that um, measuring device on 2020 and now 2021. 2020 is that blue line and 2021 is the red line. And you can see that um, as we all experienced out there, 2021 was at an even worse drought than 2020. And the decrease in, in surface of that stream uh, for which I am dependent for surface water diversion as are many others uh, was going down sooner and faster than in 2020. And that ended up in a curtailment for our valley where absolutely no irrigation from ground or surface water could occur. So you can see this is not um, just an ecological issue, it's an agricultural issue. And then boom, that red line goes up. And what is just so dramatic about that is the, the elevation in the water surface elevation and how quickly that happened. Look at that, that's just a matter of like two weeks. And all of a sudden we had um, two or more feet water in our stream. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned that that dam happened to occur at a place where we had a line of groundwater well, wells uh, running perpendicular to the stream flow. And the blue line on the top of that graph on the left-hand side is the surface water. And then each of those um, subsequent lines going down from there are groundwater uh, elevation levels. And the one, uh, the, the furthest down line that's sort of a greeny yellow is about 200 feet from the stream. And you can see that the groundwater level, uh, while not quite as high or dramatic as the surface water is paralleling that. And it happened in um, fairly um, close uh, time sequence. So not only did we get uh, surface water, but we had all that groundwater storage, which um, got mentioned before what a critical resource that is. And, Again, uh, we couldn't thank the beavers enough for deciding to build right on that data point. So we had pre and post implementation data, which is pretty unusual for a beaver dam. And then on the right hand side, there's just a little graphic elevation of what the stream water, uh, surface water elevation was prior to the dam. And then very shortly thereafter, in that couple weeks time, we had all that additional water in the dam. And I will point out that this really was the only water uh, in the valley in which juvenile coho were rearing. So um, think about the asset that that's providing in terms of preserving that incredible, incredibly um, limited and important resource. Okay, go to the next slide, please. 
Um, so in um, locations where you don't have um, beavers, um, beaver dam mimicry or beaver dam analogs are a real option. And as mentioned, this has been done in our valley. Many of the same um, benefits and uh, liabilities apply to these as to natural beaver dams. So I will say um, none of the beaver dams that we've created are as effective uh, or beaver dam analogs are as effective as the natural beavers are. They just do a better job and they do it with materials you wouldn't believe, just little tiny sticks and stones and mud. And they're just at it all the time as, as they're very, busy and they're out there repairing and maintaining these structures um, more or less continuously. So if you have an option to use beavers or partner with them, um, I think it's much cheaper, easier, and more effective than the beaver dam analogs. We have had beavers come in and start maintaining and using the beaver dam analogs once they're implemented. So it can be a real um, part partnership and syner synergy there. All right, the next slide. I also um, just a note two minutes. Okay. Um, so Sarah made um, uh, asked really to have some of the difficulties um, of living with beavers and using them outlined. And I mentioned some of the kind of practical on the ground, but there are the legal and regulatory concerns that people um, have mentioned previously. And one is that um, there is um, regulation saying that you should not impede or tend to impede fish passage. And while most of us that have lived with fish and beavers and beaver dam analogs um, believe that when there's enough water for fish to go upstream, these structures are easily passable. This isn't always clear to the regulatory authorities and they um, really have a lot of angst around this issue. Um, the issue of quote, losing water or impeding downstream water or decreasing water to your downstream water users has been raised and this can cause conflict with your um, downstream neighbors. Um, so if you're considering implementing beaver dam analogs, I really encourage you to um, proactively outreach to your downstream um, neighbors and also to consider implementing um, after an irrigation season. Liability um, to downstream water users, um, this decrease of uh, water supply, and also the issue of what if one ruptures and there's an abrupt uh, flow of water that causes damage, um, is a real uh, issue. And then the critical habitat issue, once you have beavers, you have increased water. If you have a listed species, whether it be birds, fish, or whatever, and they come in and occupy this habitat, it can potentially increase uh, regulatory risk to landowners. And people are pretty darn goosey about that. So that's something to consider um, as you look forward to doing this kind of restoration. Uh, and last slide, I think that might be it. Oh, is it worth it? Um, so it's not insignificant and there are issues to consider, um, particularly in a smaller uh, landscape setting. Uh, if you have a huge ranch and all the issues are sort of your own to own, uh, the concerns about how you interface with your neighbors um, might be less prevalent in a smaller land setting or if there's urban uh, it, issues, these are way more complex and demanding issues. Is it worth it? I can't tell you. Um, like other of our speakers, this stream was a tiny little trickle going down the middle of this channel, uh, really providing no ecological or water storage benefits. And, and, and look at, at what we had after the implementation of beaver dam analogs that then subsequently the beavers came in and utilized and made much more effective. So that is my concluding comments. Awesome, thank you, thank you, thank you, Betsy. And thank you, John, and thank you, Tracy. Really appreciate you guys taking time out of your morning to join us. Um, all right, so shall we open up, actually, before we open up the q can we give like a round of applause? You can use your little emojis, you can use your little hands. We're just, we're so grateful that you took time out. Um, it's so nice getting to meet and hear from you and hear your stories. Um, I would like to now, and it is the season of gratitude, although I'd like to say that should be year round, but we'll be extra, extra grateful. Um, so now I'm gonna open us up for Q and A. Um, let me check where we're at on our time. Okay, so we've got um, just under just under half an hour for Q and A. And so we can, you can either raise your hands uh, with your emoji. You can either literally raise your hand and I'll flip between the screens 
or you can put in the chat box that you have a question or a comment and we can go from there. Don't everybody rush at once. Okay, Mr. Moretti, go for it. So uh, thank you, that was very uh, educating. Uh, my question is, uh, John, you said the beavers just showed up or uh, did, were they planted? And then when they were done eating, and then when they were done eating, what they were uh, your wooded areas, whatever, uh, and they moved on. Where did they go, and who inherited them? Yeah, it was a it was a Kevin Costner thing. When we built it, they came. They were not planted. They uh, it, it's it's really it's really pretty interesting. So you think about Oco County. There's there's not a lot of water not a lot of moving water. Um, they had to come a long ways. And I, I really think the beavers that showed up at Susie Creek came overland from Maggie Creek, which is, I don't know, probably, probably a good 10 mile hike over, over rangeland. That's, I believe that. And, and what, why they did it and how they knew to do it. Um, yes, makes you believe in God. I don't know. <laughs> Okay. And then the second part of your question, did you get that answered, Mike, as far as? No, when okay. they, when they moved on, when they I'm moved sorry. on, when they moved on, yeah, where did they go? I, I, I think just up and down the system, they, they, they just more or less move from where they, where they, they, they try to, they try to make a living on cat, on cattail marsh for a while, it seems like, but it must not be really good dam material, nor, nor forage for them, so. They 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 move on to to a new place that's got willow and 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 start all over and it seems to be for the most part just up and down that system. I have one more question. What what is in maybe I don't know who can answer it. What's the gestation period on a beaver, and what do they uh, you know how many do how many times do you know what happens with their system? I I'm not real sure. I. I would, I, it's three, three, four months seems to stick in my head, but I, I'll let somebody smart answer that one. Yeah, what um, about Brock and Kate might know that one. Brock and so Kate. Was the question about gestation period? Uh -huh. Yeah, I yes. mean, beaver have one litter a year and they usually, depending on where they are, what climate, um, they're usually gonna be pregnant and kidding like from April to June is generally, but I don't know the actual total days of gestation. Well, two, one, yeah. one, what do they call them? A pup? I mean, is it one, two, three, a kit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, so they generally have anywhere from two to eight kits. Oh. Really depends on the carrying capacity of, of the forage of where they are. And uh, not all of them survive. And, um, you know, for whatever reasons they get preyed upon, et cetera. But beavers live in a colony. And so unlike most rodents, they their kits stick around for two to three years and get all the training and help collaborate on all the work. And, and then they out migrate. And so that's where the overland moment can happen that John was talking about. They need to find another place. And if they can't find something that's you know really abundant on the system that they're on, they will actually try to go overland, but they don't survive all, you know, it's about a 45% survival rate for those dispersers. It's, it's dangerous being a beaver out of water. Thank you, Kate, super appreciate that. Um, I see that Scott Dunbar has his hand raised and then Peter, I see your hand is raised. So Scott and then Peter. Yeah, thank you so much, you guys. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, I was curious if, um, if you noticed any difference um, on calf predation um, as a result of the beavers being in, involved in the system or more present in the system? Uh, no, no, for Maggie Creek Ranch, we didn't. Uh, our, our, our predators would be coyote or mountain lion and, and I, I don't see any difference in their numbers before or after beaver. Thank you, John. Tracy, Betsy, do you have anything to add to that question? We didn't have any. We are like wildland urban interface, I would say, in the valley. So like yeah. there's a cemetery on one side, a 
couple ranchettes on the other side, a horse facility half a mile. So I, we didn't see anything. The only challenge we had was, like I said, is pushing them to get across to use the other forage. But, you mm -hmm. know, we take that into consideration when we go to move them and, you know, as part of our management plan, um, you know, to limit that potential risk. But no, there was no changes in predation. Yeah, and just to note, um, where Tracy's uh, ranch and this operation is, is taking place is just outside of Auburn, up by Grass Valley, um, for point of reference. Betsy, did you have anything to add to that with Scott's question? No. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Scott, Peter Scott, I'm sorry. Scott, I'm okay. curious if you had experience here. Do you, do you have experience with that? Um, not personally, but um, I, I definitely had heard of some stories um, with the Forest Service last summer. Um, I was up in the Shasta Trinity, um, definitely came across a number of, uh, of beaver carcasses. And so I was just generally curious about if, if it was a more desirable target versus, uh, versus a calf or just generally looking at the implementation um, and how it affects stocking rates. So. Well, a calf should have a cow defending it where a beaver likely wouldn't. Right. <laughs> oh, but that would be cool. <laughs> that would be cool. Protecting the beaver, like, no, giving us more food and water. This is our precious. Um, could, I, could I just add to Scott's point there to yeah. say that that's interesting, Scott, you observe uh, beaver uh, mortality because that's what, to Kate's point about um, the success rate on beavers out migrating in general. Uh, they, uh, mountain lion really love beaver. If you got wolf in the system, they do obviously grizzly bears will as well. But in our part of the world, uh, mountain lion just really love beaver. And so it may be that more beaver takes pressure off mountain lions hunger because they're eating beaver and not trying to work on calves or sheep. Yeah, good point, Brock. Um, Sally, I saw that you had your hand raised. Did you have a separate question or is it something to add on to this discussion? Did you say you have a separate question? Okay, well, I'm gonna... do. okay, so Peter, Peter's next. So after Peter, then Sally. Thank you, Sarah. Um, sure. I just, um, mostly around Betsy's talk, which uh, all of you, I found these, these uh, descriptions of these projects and the beaver really, really interesting to me. Um, first of all, I was wondering about how the regulators, you touched on a little bit, but how the regulators such as say Fish and Wildlife view the building of structures in the creek. I've always been known that to be a bad thing. And I'm wondering how that, that could, maybe some of you could weigh in on it. And I'll just finish my questioning with, um, uh, Betsy, you talked about the neighbors being worried about um, upsetting the flow downstream. And, and maybe some of you can weigh in on this, but I would think as you hydrate your section of watershed, it would create a more consistent flow downstream. And in, in like here we have problems with hot weather taking the stream level down. And I would think if there were beaver ponds upstream, you'd actually have a more consistent flow over time. And I'm wondering if some of you can weigh in on that part of the question too. Well, I'll, I'll start out. There's tons of data around um, improving low flow conditions with upstream um, beaver dams but people aren't always entirely rational. And um, when they see that you have tons of water and maybe they don't, which may or may not be related to activities on your property, maybe down below is a losing reach anyhow, um, there is just um, a feeling that maybe that water should be downstream. And if you put a notch in it, they get that water. Um, and there is, if you're putting, for instance, putting in a beaver dam analog, there can be a short-term interruption of flow. So just being aware of these issues and then proactively addressing them and doing that outreach, I think is really critically important. And if your neighbor was having um, difficulty getting water and then happened to see that you had a lot without understanding what was happening upstream proactively, it, it just wouldn't be good public relations. So it's just something to be aware of. As far as the in-stream structure issue with the CDFW, it, it remains to be an ongoing issue. And um, there's been a tremendous amount of outreach uh, and engagement with them to try and bring them on the slow it, store it, sink it um, journey. And um, some of the uh, agency personnel are getting it and, and really supporting and some are not. So there's a great deal of variation 
um, depending on who you have out in the field. And I'm just going to share that um, over this past summer, I had a CDFW permitting authority looking at my personal diversion to get a, a, a lake and stream bed alteration agreement. And there was a downstream beaver dam and they just strongly felt that perhaps I had constructed that structure to push water into my diversion. And so there was a great deal of discussion about that. I had to get NOAA out to certify that it was indeed a natural structure rather than something I had created. And then that person also asked me to breach that dam in order to um, allow fish passage. And again, NOAA had to intervene and say, no, that's critical habitat and there's uh, listed species uh, rearing there. So uh, again, there's a great deal of variation amongst uh, department personnel across the state, but it is something um, to, to understand that there may be challenges and issues around it for the landowner involved and that there could conceivably re be regulatory risk associated. And if you're supporting landowners really being willing to come in behind them and, and, and support them if these issues um, come up is, is very important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Betsy. Um, we have 10 more minutes. So everybody keep the questions and comments and thoughtfulness going. Um, we have Sally next and then Tristan, I see that you have your hand raised. So Sally and then Tristan. Okay, I kind of have an overall question for everybody. I just kind of want to get an idea of how big your projects are. So um, if you could talk about how many years your project has been happening, um, how many beaver dams you have, maybe the numbers of beavers, um, and whether or not, um, you know, these um, habitats have extended beyond your uh, property lines. And anybody can answer, but I'd like to hear from all three of you. I'm not, I'm not sure, Tracy, do you just have BDAs or do you have beavers? Both. There's both there. So the original picture that I showed was the beavers came in and then they put the beaver dam analog um, further downstream that actually pushed it up into the floodplain. And so, but they had to take out the levees, which was a critical part of actually making our project successful. So just off of the top of my head, I want to say, oh, Damien's answering right now. Mm -hmm. That's impactful <laughs> timing. So <laughs> um, when Damien gets in here, then he can answer the rest of this question. I think that there is at least three beavers based on me being down there. Damien might have a better answer. Damien, if you can hear me, how many beavers might be there? But I know they put in like two analogs. There was a couple um, further upstream of natural beaver dams. And then I think the flooded area was maybe 15 to 20 acres that really got the new floodplain that it reached into, but it also started reaching into some other areas, but it all was on, I don't think we've had any impact on the downstream water users um, or anyone or even upstream um, as our project. So it was, like I said, we had the floodplain was all under um, the land trust property. So. And how many miles of Creek, uh, if I didn't ask that, that in terms of the size of your project? So that area I would say is less than a quarter of a mile. It's a short, it's a short span. It, the whole parcel I think is only 650 acres that one is. Thank like you. the whole uplands and the riparian area. And John or Betsy? Um, it, a project is hard to describe because um, the beavers were there for several years. And then um, as mentioned, they sort of ate themselves out of house and home and or um, someone removed them and or they were predated. So then we didn't have beavers for, for quite a few years, um, which was a great loss. And then they're back. Um, we have about a half mile of creek frontage. Um, it splits the, the, uh, the creek splits um, to the adjacent landowner. So anything that happens in the creek affects both of us. Um, so um, yeah, it's a it's complex uh, landscape. Okay, thank you, Betsy. John, do you have anything to add? So we we've been we've been partnering, I guess, with Beaver for 30 years on three watersheds, Maggie Creek, Susie Creek, and the Humboldt River, which which I'm going to guess is probably about 20 miles of 
a riparian system. Um, I, I can't I can't make a good guess how many beaver that would be. I I don't think I don't think much more than a hundred. I would guess, but but probably in there somewhere. We're we're strictly beaver dam digital, no beaver dam analog. <laughs> <laughs> very poor bad very poor dad joke there sorry <laughs> we need those that was great thank you <laughs> um okay tristan i see that you have your hand raised and you're on mute there we hi go. thanks everybody uh, for the presentation um my question was mostly for john um have you had neighboring ranches uh, follow suit, um, take steps to do that revegetation by removing cattle for the hot uh, season, or just start asking you about um, how they can bring more beavers onto their property, or or are they just moving on now that they're uh, nearby? I realize you have a very large ranch. Thank you. Yeah, you betcha. So, uh, yes. Short answer, yes. A little bit longer answer. Uh, in, in the Maggie Creek drainage, we we actually partnered with with our two neighboring ranches about at the same time. Um, and then and then the Susie Creek drainage, we it, it was that model of of our upstream neighbors saw how good it was going for us and 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 sort of made made the same changes that we did. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for the question, Tristan, and thank you so much, John, for sharing your experience on that. Uh, Mr. Rubenstahl, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you all for the presentation. Really neat to hear from such different um, areas, um, different ecosystems. Um, I think one of the bigger conflicts that we find in this area or would find in this area is, and it's been hinted at in most of the presentations, is with infrastructure, culverts, uh, stream crossings, fence lines, all that kind of stuff. So I'm wondering if um, anyone on the panel or, or all of you could kind of speak to how you overcame some of those challenges with, um, I know Betsy, you were kind of talking about that one pipe that kept getting clogged and um, just if there's low hanging fruit or some sort of solutions to, um, you know, if when these critters move in and, and start building their dams, what um, what are some easy ways to work through some of those um, conflicts that may come with existing infrastructure? Yeah, and I want to um, open that up to the panelists as well as Kate and Brock and Damian too, who have experience with that. So take it away, whoever wants to start with responding to that. Thank you for that question, Ruben Stahl. So I can start, like I mentioned our infrastructure problem. Um, and so when we went when we were facilitating the bigger projects with the partners program, they actually worked really closely with us as the ranchers on what projects to do. So instead of just doing single gates, in one of those pictures, we had double gates, so it was easier to move the cattle through. Um, you know, we put in some a water gap in one area that they're now able to drink from. And so in we really talked about what was the grazing plan as we were creating this riparian pasture versus a more of a riparian exposure, exposure. And so I think because we were at the table, um, we did one of the data removals, um, actually had the opportunity to bid and use that as alternative income for our operation as well. And so I think being at the table, being asked to be a part of it, being part of the design is um, an important part, especially if you're bringing in outside partners. And so, and then um, they did, I know, talk with the other neighbors um, as part of our project of what we were what we were working on. And so it was, I think that communication was the key on it and having us at the table. And, you know, because it wasn't, it was ground that we lease, um, it wasn't our own one. So I think we're in a little bit different circumstances, but we did have external partners coming in. And so we were asked to be at the table. There was regular meetings or text messages and emails back and forth. So we knew what was going on and it wasn't a surprise. Well, thanks. Anyone else want to speak to that? So, uh, thinking about fencing, I think I think Tracy showed pretty well that what what our experience is is that you know if your if your riparian system is adjacent to to pasture or rangeland that's that's going to have dormant season grazing, if you build that fence right on the green line, you will fail. I, I, I like to say that the best fence keeps a cow from going where she really didn't want to go anyway. 
Um, so if you build it right on the green line, you're going to fail. So, so build it. I, I think, I think Tracy kind of showed that that's what they did. They moved it somewhat off the green line and, and had better luck with it. Um, we had a really similar experience that Betsy talked about with, with a beaver that would plug a culvert nightly. And, and there's, there's structures that you can build that, that, uh, will prevent that, but but in my experience, that beaver makes a really good hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, John. Um, Kate, I saw that you turned your mic off for a second and I do wanna be um, aware of our time. We have a minute left, so this will be our, our last question being answered. And then we might wanna have just some closing remarks if anybody has any closing statements to share. But Kate, I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to answer Eric's questions. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm just so excited to be part of this panel. And John, I've been following your work for years and I'm a big fan. So really grateful for you taking the time and just, yeah, it's you're such a fantastic spokesperson for this process. And so, you know, Betsy showed some of the other strategies. You can protect your vegetation with fencing, with hot wire. You know, there's all these different strategies that have been tested and yeah they require some maintenance but it's better than having to do the daily thing of, of keeping the beaver out and culverts can be protected and brock and i just had the pleasure of installing a device that you can put in twin, twin track weirs that keep the beaver from blocking it and it's been tested out on setter wildlife Na national refuge for a couple years now really really uh, helps and is super low tech, easy slide in, you, you, you just basically maintain it once a year rather than daily. So we're really interested in supporting folks that are have the blessing of getting to live in the midst of beaver to receive all the habitat benefits, but also mitigate against the potential damages. So Brock posted our booklet that's uh, in the chat if you wanna check that out and we're happy to consult and uh, make these solutions available to anyone who's interested. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I also want to just jump in and thank John for that photo with the uh, the fence. Uh, I thought that was a nice. Um, we when I was working in Colorado, did similar work with fencing to kind of um, position it in just these um, certain zones, which I think can be pretty effective in in um, a lot of different systems. So thanks all for the remarks. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much. And as Kate mentioned, Brock did put a link um, into the chat. So they're free Occidental Art and Ecology Center Beaver in California, creating a culture of stewardship. The link is there as well as Brock provided he and Kate's email addresses. Um, and that's for just continuing on this conversation because I feel like a lot of us could just enjoy this all day long, but we do have a board meeting to carry on with. Um, both of their email addresses are, are there. Um, Everyone who's here, you're welcome to stay and, and enjoy the rest of the board meeting. Um, you're also welcome to head on back to the rest of your day. I just wanted to give a huge, 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 big thank you from the bottom to the top of my heart for the panelists and for Brock and for Damien and for Kate for showing up this morning. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you sharing your experience. And um, you know, here's one good thing about Zoom where we're all able to be together and sharing this information, even with John over in Idaho, we got Tracy up in the foothills. So um, thank you so very much. And um, yeah, hope, hope that we get to continue this conversation into the future. <laughs>